Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live at Calvary Church in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media or to tune into our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Now here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Take your Bibles, open them to Genesis chapter 41, and let's finish off the chapter this time. Genesis chapter 41, and the Bible study is entitled, Valleys Turn Into Mountaintops. Valleys Turn Into Mountaintops. We're following the life of Joseph here at the end of Genesis. His life is clearly in the hands of the Lord. Even though it's been challenging and hard, and difficult for Joseph. We know that his life is in the hands of God. He paid the highest price in his family, of all of his siblings. He paid the highest price for his dad's failures in relationship to that favoritism. And it started there in his family. The challenges that he faced. He goes from the pit to prison, to being forgotten, and now standing before Pharaoh. Along the way, he's learned that the Lord is with him wherever he is. Just jot this psalm down. You may need it this week. In Psalm 95 and verse three, it says, for the Lord is the great God and the great king above all gods. In his hands are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. O come and let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today you will hear his voice. Isn't that true even now? Today you will hear his voice. It wasn't too long ago that I was sitting in my office And I may have shared this before, but I'm going to do it by repeating because I'm reading this verse and I think it's important that you download this song if you have music, you know, whatever you use for music. So I'm sitting in my office and uh, when I'm in my office, there's almost always people in there, but this was just one of those moments where nobody was there. I, in front of my computer, doing whatever I was doing, the door was open. And if you haven't noticed in our building, we have music playing 24 hours, seven days a week, worship music. It's all piped all throughout, anywhere we could put a speaker. Even we have speakers pointing to the parking lot because if somebody wants to rip us off, they're going to have to worship God while they're ripping us off outside. But really, it's to set the pattern in the atmosphere so that when you, even when you get out of your car, you come onto the property, this property is dedicated to God. It is saturated with music that honors God. And if all the electronics work and all the knobs are turned, there is worship music playing everywhere uh, in this building all day, all night, including in the offices. So my door was open. I, and I'm there for a moment, catching my breath. There's really nothing in front of me. And the music caught my ear. And that is another reason why we have music piping through because you never know when you need to be encouraged or you just need a song to be played and and that's where the Lord's gonna use. And there was this song and as I'm listening to it, I'm like reminded, it reminds me of uh, music that I grew up with as a new believer. Uh, It sounds so similar to the type of music that the Vineyard put out so many years ago. And it's a genre of music that I was so appreciative of and, and just recently even brought it all back to be encouraged. I've got downloaded a bunch of 90s uh, CDs. Uh, really, they don't do CDs anymore of, of that music that I grew up on to, to remind me and strengthen me and encourage me. So I'm listening to the song in my office and I don't know what it is. So I pull out Shazam and I go, boom, I want to hear. And, uh, and so I put my phone up there, let it play for me. And it's a song. Uh, if you want to download it, it's called Pastures, P-A-S-T-U-R-E-S. And it's such a beautiful song that reminds me, even as I'm reading this, that God, you are my God. And we are the people of your pasture. We belong to him. And the song talks about not only God, Jesus taking care of us, in green pastures, but also when we come to him that we have found everything we've been looking for. He has us completely taken care of. And that place of abiding 
pastures. And I don't quite remember. Let me see. Um, let me just take some moment here. We, we don't have any service afterwards. So let me just see. Let me give you the artist, especially as this plays back on the radio at another time. Uh, it's House Fires. That's who I thought it was. So it, the name of the song is Pastures. And the album that it, or the group that sings it is House Fires. And I just know it'll bless you. It's a lower key song, a slower song. It's one of those meditative songs that will encourage you and remind you that you are the sheep of his pasture. And even today, you know, in the, in the political climate and what's going on, you're seeing these phrases pop up as if it's a bad thing to be a sheep. I don't know if you've seen this, but you're just a sheep. And I know the motive of that. It's all the different things that are happening in the culture and the world. But we don't live primarily in this culture or world. We live primarily in the kingdom of God. And I want you to know on the authority of God that in the kingdom of God, it is a good thing to be a sheep. You want to be a sheep. You want to trust the Lord with your life. You want him to take care of you. You want him to sustain you. You want him to encourage you. You want him to remind you that you are in his hands, that he's taking care of your life, that there's meaning and purpose in these times like Joseph's life that he doesn't have anyone to explain this to him. He doesn't yet know how good it is. He only knows the bad. And yet even in the bad, he's embraced that he follows a God who's faithful And you know, here we are as believers living in the new covenant, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, baptized with the Holy Spirit. We have a Bible in almost every version. If you have a phone, then you've got 25 versions on your phone and we live with less faith than Joseph did. And God says, no more. Walk by faith. Trust the Lord with your life. You're in his hands. You're sheep of his pasture. He's gonna take good care of you. And in our lives, we certainly have these experiences that are described as the valley. The valley, you get the picture of low, dark, difficult, the unknown, the hill so high you can't see where you are. The psalmist, David, he uses that phrase, remember, in Psalm 23? He uses the valley. And he talks about the good shepherd taking care of him as a sheep. And what does he say? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. The valleys can be scary and hard and almost seemingly endless. But you know, he's the God of the valley. That was a setup for amen. So let me say it again. Do you know he's the God of the valley? Yeah, you need to know that. And there are other times where we have this glorious mountaintop experience where things couldn't be better, where victory comes, prodigals come home, the lights go back on. It's wonderful. We're not in the valley anymore. And you know what? He's the God of the mountaintop. That was another setup, church. Stay with me. I don't want to hear people on the radio louder than you. He is the God of the mountaintop. So it doesn't really matter where you are. God is there with you. He's faithful in victory and in defeat in the highs and the lows. God rules and reigns in our lives. His timing is always perfect. He allows and uses the trials and suffering to strengthen us. At times he uses the trials in our lives to chasten us, to draw us back to himself, to teach us, to discipline us, to disciple us. Why? Because God is preparing us for the place he has prepared for us. God is always doing a work. And many times we lose that consciousness of him in the valley. We forget this. As we're going through times of suffering, we sort of lose the consciousness of who God is, but he's still God of the valley as well as the God of the hills. He is with you and you're not alone. Joseph's life is a great example of this. We pick up again where we left off. We'll kind of overlap a little bit. Pick up in verse 17 of Genesis 41. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, behold, in my dream, I stood on the bank of the river and these seven cows came up out of the river, fine looking and fat, (laughs) and they fed in the meadow. And behold, seven other cows came up, poor and very ugly and gaunt, such ugliness that I've never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the gaunt and the ugly cows ate up the first seven and the fat cows, and they ate them up. No one 
would have even known that they eaten them, for they were just as ugly as at the beginning. And I awoke. And I saw in a dream, and suddenly seven heads came up on one stalk, full and good. And behold, verse 23, seven heads withered, thin, blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them. And the thin heads devoured the seven good heads. And so I told this to the magicians, and there was no one could do it that could explain it to me. And then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. So pause there for a second and let's be reminded just how fast God gives the answer. Joseph gets brought in, he's remembered in prison. He gets brought into the, the known, the leader of the known world. He hears these wild dreams and instantly a quick answer from the Lord. Just as the last breath is leaving Pharaoh's lips, just as the last word is finished, the last syllable, God already has an answer and Joseph already has it because God can move that fast. Pharaoh here represents to us the world in which we live, what they're experiencing, what they're going through. I mean, it stumbles you at at times. How do you think the world feels? There's no purpose and no no direction and everything's going to be lost but we know there's a better day coming and not all is lost. And people in our world are like Pharaoh today, mixed up and confused. They don't understand why there's so much evil in the world. They don't understand why kids are hooked on drugs. They can't figure out what's going on in Israel and the Middle East. They don't know if there's life after death. They they are approached to Jesus. He's mythological and he doesn't exist and God he couldn't have created and There are fanciful theories to replace God. But you're like Joseph. And Joseph here becomes a type of you. And you have answers that come from God. You answer with the wisdom of God. You answer with the word of God to give meaning and purpose that the spirit of God will take the wisdom and word and bring it home to their hearts. Because I know how it feels. People ask you hard questions and you only say what you know and you're like, I don't even feel like it's all sufficient. I don't even know if that was the right answer. But you know, you give your best and the Lord will take the rest. You let him take his word and use it. You just give it. I know you feel ill-equipped that you don't know much about the Bible, but there's no qualification to know much about the Bible to give an answer or to talk about your testimony, or what God has done or is doing in your life. For some of you, it's just, hey man, I don't know. God loves me. I'm reading the Bible right now. It's kind of hard to understand, but I check it out. It's kind of cool. I'm reading in Genesis right now, but I do know this. I was blind, but now I see. And you know, especially if they knew you before you got saved, you're like, you remember who I was? Oh, I remember. Well, I'm not that person anymore. Well, how is that possible? Well, let me introduce you to a man. His name is Jesus. And I'll just, why don't you come to church with me? That's how that meant. Just come to church with me. Or, no, I don't ever set foot in church. Well, that's fine. We'll bring the church to you. There's a radio station. You can listen all on your own. And you can just tune it in. And there's so many tools for us that you, you, you have to ask yourself, with all of the reasons why you're not stepping into lives, are those reasons, listen, church, hear me out. Are those reasons just really excuses for not living the light that God has given to you? and just stepping into people's life. You don't need to know the Bible. You don't need to know it front and back in order to love someone. And you know, over time, you're gonna learn. Over time, you're gonna gain some things. Over time, you're gonna grasp some of the difficulties. Over time, you're gonna be able, maybe the answer is, yeah, and evil in this world, it hurts my heart too. And you share one of the difficult stories in your life where God has been comforting you and where you have some things unresolved, where someone in your neighborhood or someone at work actually begins to see a real believer in their lives. Not one that has all the cliches and all the bumper stickers and all that, not, not one that just speaks in, in things not experienced, but rather a real believer is living life on a different plane, at a different level, but experiencing the same things. Let me show you a scripture. Turn over to John 14. For those of you that feel ill-equipped today, for those of you that, just like are still yet unconvinced. Let's listen to what Jesus had to say. He says it much better than I have. Go to John chapter 14, pick up with me in verse 25. John 14, verse 25. He says, he says, these things I've spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, 
He will teach you all things. And listen, bring to your remembrance the things that I said to you. There's the work of remembrance. In the gospel of Luke, and I believe it was a chapter 12, Jesus instructs the disciples. He says, when you're brought before magistrates, you're brought before these, like someone like Pharaoh is just overwhelming. You don't know what to say. He, he basically says, don't worry about what you're going to say because the Holy Spirit will give you the words that are needed in that moment. You don't need to worry about it. Don't worry yourself out of faithfulness. Just trust the Lord along the way. I believe Joseph was here before Pharaoh prayed up and prepared. And now he stands with confidence to speak forth the word of God. Joseph said to Pharaoh, verse 25, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows, verse 26, are seven years. And the seven good heads are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven thin and ugly cows which came up after them are seven years and the seven empty heads blighted by the east one are seven years of famine. This is the thing which I've spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come through all the land of Egypt, but after them, seven years of famine will arise and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt and the famine will deplete the land." The dream covers 14 years, Pharaoh, in just a quick amount of time. God gave him insight in his dream. I mean, you know, check this out. God doesn't have to do this, but he speaks to an unbeliever in dreams, which is a big testimony right now in the Middle East among the Muslims in the Islamic world, that God is breaking through all the barriers that are up against the gospel and against missionaries and the Bible and in Arabic. And all. It's, he's break, God is breaking, none of that stops the work of God. He's speaking to the guys and gals in dreams, <laughs> right to them, like Pharaoh here. Oh, I don't, you're reading the, some of these stories and you might be real skeptical. I don't believe this. I don't believe it. But this is not new stuff, folks. God is able to break through even beyond what you're able to do, like he's doing with Pharaoh. And he gave him insight of the next 14 years and then gave him someone to interpret it for him. And that may be one of the prayers that you have for your loved ones. Like, Lord, send somebody that can interpret the life situations into their lives because they're just not listening to me. Send someone with a voice. And so there's a warning about Egypt, a famine and drought and destruction. And it was really good news for Pharaoh to know ahead of time so that he could prepare. And already Pharaoh's thinking about how he's going to handle it. Notice in verse 31. It says, so the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following. It'll be very severe. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. So don't miss what, what Joseph is doing here. He's making sure... Pharaoh understands, this is God, this is God, this is God, this is God. It's not your magicians, it's not me. God is giving you insight. Not only is God showing you, but God will also bring it to pass. Notice back in verse 28, it says, this is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. I, it's my voice, but God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do what he is about to do. Listen, it's important to remember that man can't save himself. It's the work of God. Man can't save himself. You can't redeem yourself. You, you're unable to forgive your own sins. You remember John, when he was in Revelation, as he had that, that word that was given to us, he was so overcome. He, he was at that place where who's gonna open the scrolls? We're done. There's nobody here that can open the scrolls in Revelation 5, verse 4. So I wept much, John says, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Behold, Joseph, there's a greater than Joseph as we read of his life. Jesus Christ, he is able. He is able. When we are unable and unable, when it's impossible with man, it is possible with God. God is going to do it, Pharaoh. 
God's going to take care. It's not you, not me. These years of plenty and years of famine, they're going to be sent by God. It was all part of his providential plan. Why? Well, we can look back now and we know. They don't know this yet, but we can look back and they know this. First of all, this dream and all of this happening in Egypt, what things that were happening in the physical realm, famine, painful difficulty, first of all, would get Jacob and his sons out of Canaan. Now, how would you know that? I wouldn't know that. We wouldn't know until it happens. But I'll tell you, just as sure as I'm speaking to you now, you can read the rest of Genesis, you will see that this event will get Jacob and his sons out of Canaan. Remember back in chapter 38 when we were studying then with Judah and Tamar, we saw just how wicked and corrupt they were becoming in Canaan. They needed to be taken out of the land. Secondly, this famine would get the the children of Israel, Jacob and his sons, into Goshen. That's where God wanted them, where they would grow and multiply into a large nation. So the work that God's doing through the global or the regional, I would say with Egypt, it's more of a regional thing. The thing that God's doing regionally in Egypt is for the sake of movement. He's going to deliver a family, a small group of people, and then he's going to place them where they belong. And isn't that true in your life? Through trials and difficulties, it moves us from one place to another. And if we follow the leading of the Lord, he's going to place us in the new position where he wants us to be. You see, it's good to be reminded and whether it's said out loud or not in Bible study, one thing we remember in every Bible study is that the story of your life is not about you. It's God using you and me and the circumstances in our life to arrange eternal history. That's hard because sometimes to arrange eternal history, he has you in a valley. And nobody likes the valleys. The valleys that represent difficulty and challenge and darkness and sorrow and sadness and fear, death. Nobody likes that. Death is an enemy. But if he wants to get you out of Canaan, he may bring famine in your life. If he wants to get you to Goshen, he might bring famine in your life. It'll help you explain some of the world events today. You don't need to know all the answers. You don't need to have it all put together. You don't need to piece together and all this. And what about this? And what about that? Certainly it's prophetically fulfilling what the Bible has already said. But I do know this, even though I don't have the answer for everything and what's this and who's the Antichrist and what's going on and what about artificial intelligence and all the things that can waste your life trying to figure out. I do know this, God uses famine to move his people into the right place. And if you're willing, God will move you to the right place. For what? For for the sake of displaying Messiah. That's what this is all about. The whole Bible points to Jesus. That's the whole Bible. Jesus said in the volume of the book, it is written of me. And you step back and you're like, man, Lord, I don't like this. I don't want this, but I embrace it. If it breaks me to the place where Messiah, Jesus was revealed in my life. This is God used famine. That's real hunger. It's real challenges. It's real darkness for the sake of bringing about plenty to move a small group of people in the right place. And sometimes you think your life is so insignificant. What does it mean? And 8 billion people, I think is the latest number, 8.1 billion people on the planet right now. What is my life? Well, your life matters a lot. And God will use famine and difficulty and economic collapse and and socioeconomical issues and political uprisings. And he will use the last days in which we live to move you and to place you. And who knows, some of you might be standing before Pharaoh. Somebody that has great sway and importance. And you might have good advice for him like Joseph does. I mean, think about these words coming out of Joseph's mouth where he is sharing with him and he gets to the place and he says, you know, you, you're gonna have to choose someone in verse 33. Pharaoh, here's what, here's what God's telling you right now. You ready, Pharaoh? You ready? Prisoner, 
just got cleaned up for you, but I've spent the last few years in prison. I just want you to know, you got to know something. Pharaoh, you got to select a discerning and wise man, and you got to put him in charge. <laughs> Do you think he has any idea that that's a different way of saying, I think I'm the guy. God sent me to you. I think I can help. God has more wisdom. He's going to give it to me. But this is humility here. This is humility. It's amazing because most of the time there's people pushing for position and wanting something and look at me. I mean, again, this is the way the world works. So I understand some of it, but on your resume, when you're looking for a job, you know, it's not a resume of failures. Well, I got fired here and I got fired there. And I was lazy there. And, and I want a chance to get fired here too. You know, it's like nobody ever puts that. You, you read your resume and you're like, you are the best possible person that you can think of. I mean, if you uh, went to the water cooler and got a cup of water, you were the manager of waterworks. You know, it's like, here's what I've done. I am in charge of water. Dude, you went to the water fountain. Come on now. But that's the way the world works. But the way of humility, Jesus says, when you go, don't take the front seat. Don't play. God, I will take care of your life. Yeah, but, but if you do it, Lord, I'm going to go to pit. I'm going to be thrown in a pit. Yeah, because there's something for you to learn in the pit. Well, if I get into the pit, then, I, then I'm going to be falsely accused. Yeah, you know, false accusations make a man and a woman really check their hearts, man. Because you start hearing that kind of stuff and you're like, man, is it even true, Lord? You get, you get it enough. You're like, man, Lord, maybe it's true. And then God says, no, I just wanted to draw you to myself. Like, you know, it's not true. I know it's not true. So I'm glad you're here, son, because you haven't been here in a while. I allowed those little posts over there and I allowed that over there. I allowed the famine, you know, that I allowed that so you could come to me because I want to move you and I want to place you. Don't forget, write those words down. God is moving me and God is placing me. Why? Because he's always preparing me for the place he has prepared for me. And it's actually not even on this earth, you know. The prep place that he has prepared for you is heaven. That's our final destination. That's the end to be forever with the Lord. So he's sharing this. He's like, yeah, but you're gonna have to choose this wise man. Notice, so let Pharaoh, verse 34, do this. Let him appoint officers over the land. Collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in seven plentiful years. Let them gather all the food, those good years that are coming, and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let him keep the food in the cities, that the food shall be a reserve for the land for seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. Joseph doesn't have any idea what God is doing, but he's faithful to the word. And church, you don't really know anything that God is doing right now, so be faithful to the word. You don't know and I don't know. And this is important to know when you want to quit. This is important to know when you think there's no way out. This is important to know when you are uh, ready to throw in the towel or you're so exhausted or you're tired of the warfare or the temptations are heavy. You don't know what God is doing. So be faithful to the word. Be faithful to what you know. And the, the wisdom is, I mean, this is, this is the wisdom that God gave him so that he would be the wise man he's chosen. But I wonder if Joseph even knew what he was saying. He's standing there in humility, just like boom, boom. And he's like, times like you've had before, he's like, where did that come from? I can't believe what I just said. It's like, ah, oh, Lord, you're so faithful because I deposited your word into me and now it's coming out of me. Verse 37, so the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all the servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there's no one as discerning and as wise as you. You, verse 40, shall be over my house and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne, I'll be greater than you. Talk about a promotion from prison to second in charge. He's in the palace. I'm reminded that God can blow my mind, that he can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I can think or ask. And you're like, I remember I was sharing this story recently with a group of pastors. As a new believer in the first few years of my walk with the Lord, I had one 
big ambition. And God had to root it out because it wasn't all pure, exactly pure. So don't misunderstand me. Like it wasn't the most purest ambition, but it was my ambition. And quite frankly, it wasn't to seek first the kingdom of God. Although it was in there somewhere. I had one ambition a couple years into walking with the Lord, and that was to be an assistant pastor at the church I was at. That's it. I just wanted an office with all the other guys. And that would have been my life. And I, I think if I would have ever received that, which I never did, I would have been happy with it. I think I would have enjoyed it. I think I would have been able to do for a living uh, what I've always wanted to do. And that's just minister to people and talk to them and pray with them and teach the Bible and everything. And you know, that one big desire had to be rooted out. So I never got it. Because along the way, I've had other desires and other desires. And in the place that God prepared for me, to have the privilege of serving you and to be entrusted with quite a bit of authority and quite a bit of responsibility. Along the way, God had to root out my flesh and prepare me. And the pathway of preparation is brokenness and disappointment and revelation where I'm sure Joseph at different times in his life, he's in the pit, what's his ambition? Get me out of the pit. God had more than that. If he was in Potiphar's house and he's overseeing everything, he says, I just want to see my family. God had more than that. He gets into prison. Well, we know what his desire was. It all came down to just one thing. We know his desire. You remember his desire in prison? Remember me. That's all he had. Just remember me. That's all. Just don't forget me. And what, what happened? Well, God had more than that. And here he is being faithful to Pharaoh. We don't quite know. God doesn't tell us what his desire is here. He's just being faithful to the word. He doesn't know the future. He's being faithful to the word and exceedingly abundantly than anything Joseph has thought along the way. God has placed him in second in command. The only thing he can't touch is the throne. This is God's doing. This is what I've learned over the years. I've learned it in my own life. I speak from experience but I've also seen it in the church. Everybody wants the palace, but they don't want to take the way of the pit. They want the palace right out of the gate. It just doesn't work that way. You got to be prepared for it. Well, I'm ready. Take me to school. What class can I take? Brokenness 101. Along with pain 101. Oh, and hurt. Maybe you can do 201 on that one. Disappointment. Oh, how about this? Take the class of being offended. You gotta learn how to be offended. How about this one? How about the class of, uh, I'm always overlooked. Oh, you know, you're overlooked by some, but not by God. You gotta learn that. You can listen to these Bible studies and they're good. God's sowing seeds into your heart. But the best thing to do with a Bible study is to live it so that the Holy Spirit can develop you into the man and the woman he desires you to be. That even what your ambitions are today, as godly and as good as they might be, God is exceedingly abundantly above all that you can think or ask. Right now, you're in the preparation mode. And you know, if you want to be popular, God will give you popularity and then you'll find out it's nothing. You want to be a big dog and a big shot in the church world? Well, God will let you do that too. And then you'll find out uh, there's only one big dog in the kingdom and you're not it. You know, you want uh, all the followers on Instagram, you know, you'll find out it's not a big deal. You can buy them and you can fake it. It's not that big a deal. You, you can have the applause of whoever and whatever until God finally brings you to the place. Okay, is it me and you yet? Oh no, I got one more ambition. All right, let me give it to you. And then you find out, oh man, God comes, brings you back. He says, is it you and me yet? yeah, no, I don't think so. I think you still have another desire. Okay, I do. I have another desire. Okay, let me give it to you. And many times we'll call that, you know, the backside of the desert, desert experience. You think of Moses, remember his life in the Bible, it separates into thirds very easily because he lived for 120 years. And in the first 40 years of his life, you know, as he's living, he's, wanting to aspire to be someone. He wants to be someone. Then he has that great failure and sends him to the desert, God does. Sends him to the desert 
as a consequence so he can learn that he's really no one. Just a shepherd on the backside of the desert all by himself. No prominence. And nobody knows. He meets his wife, has a family. A lot happens in the desert, you know. It's not like nothing happens in the desert. A lot happens in the desert. For what? Those first 80 years of his life was to prepare him so he understood that he was no one apart from God. That God is everyone. He is the one. And I, we don't have all the insights of Joseph. I wish there was a chapter on, okay, let me explain to you exactly everything Joseph thought, but we don't have that. But what we do have is our own thoughts. What we do have is our own experience. What we do have is our own pit. What we do have is our own prison. What we do have is our own thoughts over the years and our own ambitions till finally the Lord says, is this what you really want? And you say, no, Lord, I don't want anything. I just want you. And then God says, now you're going to get it all because you're ready. That's where Joseph is. He's ready. You are that man, Joseph. You're the man. And everywhere Joseph went, he just, everything he touched was blessed by God. God was with him. He was always promoted into positions of responsibility and he was faithful with them because that's the reward. Faithfulness is always rewarded with more. That's the reward for faithfulness. He's now he's placed in second in command. This is a serious thing because according to one commentary, the Egyptians regarded Pharaoh as a divine manifestation in human form. By accepting Joseph's interpretation of his dreams, Pharaoh chose to humble himself under Joseph's God. God rewarded this humility by preserving the land of Egypt in the coming famine. And that Pharaoh believed Joseph's interpretation and then chose to raise a young foreign prisoner to such an elevated position in his government is truly a miraculous work of God, end quote. We're watching God move in miraculous ways. And I want you to think before we head out today, well, I got more pages, but no time. Wait a minute. One more thing before we leave. Actually, there's going to be a few more things, but I have it in my notes, one more thing. I want you to think of a time that you were at your worst and you thought it was it and you're done and it's over and you can't go on anymore. But overnight or over the course of a week or even now, you can see how God has worked because God doesn't forget us. He pulls us out and he pulls us through so that our life becomes Psalm 40, verse one. I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me and he heard my cry. He bought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. And he's put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. But Pharaoh's not done yet, neither is God. Notice verse 41. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh took his signet ring off, put it on Joseph's hand, clothed him in garments of fine linen, put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in the second chariot. He gets a chariot on top of this, a four horse drive chariot. And he cried out before him, bow the knee. And he set him over all the land of Egypt. Verse 44, Pharaoh also said, I am Pharaoh. And without your consent, no man will lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphna Pa'ane, which literally means speaker of secret things. He gave him as a wife, Asenath, the daughter of Potai, Pharaoh, priest of On. Joseph went over all the land of Egypt. He was 30 years old. Don't let anyone, what does the Bible say? Don't, you young people especially, don't let anyone despise your youth in the Lord. And like I tell the young men and the young women that serve alongside of me, and I'll tell you now, there's two parts to this. Number one, don't let anyone despise your youth. And number two, don't give them a reason to. Don't give them a reason to. Don't fall prey to the temptations to be in places you don't belong. You just don't belong there. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. That's true for adults, older us older adults, and also for your young people. What do you think? You sow to the flesh, you're not going to reap corruption? What do you think? You're hanging out there, taking, doing that stuff, being so close to sin that you think it's not going to tempt you? Of course it will. 
You don't give them a reason to despise you. Rise to the calling. You're not the future of the church. You are the church. So start living it out. Be the woman. Be the man that God has called you to be. And don't give men or don't give us, these, those of us that are much older than you, some reason to despise you but rather rise to the call and live in the spirit of God. He's ready to empower you. Here, Joseph, 30 years old. 30 years old, he stands before Pharaoh. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt, verse 47. In the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly. He gathered up all the food for the seven years in the land of Egypt, laid the food in the cities, laid it up in every city, the food for the fields that surrounded them. He gathered much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting for it was out without number. God is abundantly blessing his word and using these dreams. Verse 50, Joseph were born two sons before the years of the famine came who Asenath, the daughter of Potipharai, priest of on board him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh for God has made me forget all my toil in my father's house. And the second, the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Some of you might need to circle that in your Bible. There is fruit in the land of affliction. If you would have told me that 10 years ago, I would not have believed you. I I would believe it because it's the word of God. But by the time it got from my ears to my head to my heart, I don't see affliction bearing much fruit. But I've got a little distance from one of the many trials I've experienced. I got a few years distance and I can see the fruit. I can see it. I can testify and I can watch God use the affliction. I can see an Ephraim in my life. I can see God working through. I can see his supernatural strength. I can see the depression lifting. I I can see even the discouragement. Now it's episodes of discouragement. It's not every day and every night and now it comes in seasons. And so I'd rather, instead of four seasons, I'd rather just have one season, a good season forever and ever. But then God would be preparing, what what do I have ahead? He's got to prepare me for it. And so I need to learn to take my cares to the Lord, just like you do. I need to cast my cares upon the Lord. Why? Because he cares for me. There's fruit in the land of affliction, church. There's fruit. He's caused me to be fruitful. Verse 53, then seven years of plenty, which were in the land ended and the seven years of famine began to come. And Joseph said, just like Joseph said, and the famine was in all the lands, but in the land of Egypt, there was bread. You want to know why there was bread in Egypt? Because God did it. (laughs) And he started with a dream that troubled the ruler of the world. Do you know in the Proverbs, talks about God, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and he can move it like the rivers of water. Sometimes the church sounds like they have such a weak God. Just so weak. Sometimes the church as they're crying out, they're not crying out to the Lord, they're crying out to man. And you have to ask yourself, how's that working out for you? There's no hope in man. Some men, they trust in chariots. Others trust in horses. Some men trust in politicians, systems, bosses. But the Bible says, I'm going to trust in the name of the Lord my God. He's my help and he's my strength. Joseph is, 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 here he is. God has made me forget God has brought fruit and affliction. There's bread. And so verse 55, when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to the Egyptians, go to Joseph, who's got the bread. This kid from prison. You go, he's 37 years old and he's feeding the whole country. Unbelievable, really 44 years old, I should say, two sets of sevens. Notice all the land of uh, Egypt was famished, verse 55. Go to Joseph, do what he says, verse 56. The famine was over, all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened up the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians 
and the famine became more severe in the land of Egypt. So all the countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe. So it wasn't merely a regional famine, but it also affected the world. But God used a region to accomplish his purposes and to show himself strong. Joseph opens up the storehouses and he helped the world. And it's amazing the work that God accomplishes through this man. Such a wonderful change for him. It seems almost too good to be true. It seems almost too good to be true, but it's not. God calls this grace, receiving what you don't deserve. Even Joseph going through all that pain didn't deserve the favor of God any more than you do or I do. And even if God told Joseph in the pit what he was gonna do, I was reminded of that scripture in Habakkuk when God tells Habakkuk, for I'll work a work in your days which you would not believe even if I told you. That's one reason why God doesn't tell you things ahead of time. Even if he did, you wouldn't believe it. You just gotta live it. He wants you to live by faith. God is at work. It, it is something that he has not forgotten us. We learn there are things the Lord is doing that even if he told us he, he would, we wouldn't, we couldn't believe it because it's a life of faith. It's a life of dependence. And here's Joseph living in the tremendous favor of God. Listen, church, God has a purpose in your life and all the things you're currently going through, he will bring it to pass. And if you tenaciously hold on to him, that purpose will be revealed and you go, but God, I don't see it. I don't understand it. I feel trapped. I feel like I'm in prison. And it's in that prison, you have to ask yourself, can you rejoice and praise God even in the prison? Or do you want to skip to the palace? Do you want to skip to the palace? Do you think, that life's going to be any much easier in the palace and the challenges that God will have for you on a personal level. We learn that it's not just merely the circumstances of our life, but it's life apart from Christ. And the failure to believe his purposes will make you frustrated and bitter. And there are many today, even now listening to me, that are angry with God because God didn't follow their agenda. I've come across a lot of people like that. But God can grab a hold of you as you can grab a hold of him and just lay your agendas aside and follow him because he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can think or ask. So God, we pray for our valleys to be in, turned into mountaintops. We pray for forgiveness where we're not praising you in the prison. You wait for us. You're patient with us. You, you draw us with your cords of love, but you also use these circumstances to dramatically turn our life around. And then you feed the world around us, through us. It's unbelievable. And maybe you're here today and you're frustrated and you just don't know what God is doing. You don't know why these things are happening, but now God has your attention. And I just wanna to speak to some of you, God has your attention because he wants you to repent of your sins and receive him as your savior. Is there anyone here today who would say, Ed, I need to follow Jesus Christ. That's the answer. You don't, you don't even have all the language, but I can give it to you because I know where it's at in the Bible. What you're feeling right now and sensing is that you need to be born again. You need new life. It's outside of you. It's not changing your behavior and it's not a new place to live and it's not a new job and it's not, you need Jesus. He's the answer. And he's been using these things to draw you and draw you and draw you till you finally just give up. You trust God with your life. And so today, if that's you, would you just stand to your feet? I wanna pray with you and help you follow Jesus. I wanna help you get on the right track of life. You can almost hear Jesus say, come and follow me. And that's the answer, like that's it. This is where you belong. God bless you up here in the front. Who else would say that's me? This is it. God's brought you together with him. You're not joining a church or following me. This is the work of the Lord in your life. This is God alive. You guys online, God sees you there too. And listening on the radio right now, isn't it amazing how much God loves you that he'd reach you through the technology that's so old anyway. Everybody's on the internet, but you're on the radio because God loves you. Because God's not done today on the earth. 
drawing people to himself. God bless you in the back. Now, you guys that responded, there's going to be people coming up with you, up to you, because we want you to know uh, the pastors are here to serve you and pray with you. So don't be um, uncomfortable if someone comes up to you. This is a family here. You're part of the family. God bless you here on the side. Anyone else? This is uh, special to me always on Wednesdays. I got saved on a Wednesday. Just like this. Just sitting in a church. Thinking of, I'm beyond. I'm beyond this stuff. I'm beyond church. The God he was showing me, you're not beyond me. And here I am, 30 something years later, following Jesus. Anyone else? I just sense there's some battling going on. I just want to encourage you, don't worry. It's a friendly place. God is here. You're greatly loved. He cares for you. And he loves you. He's for you, not against you. Jesus actually says he did not come to condemn, but to save. And so the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So near or far, you can talk to God. We call that prayer. That's why we have a prayer to help you talk to God, confessing with your mouth what you believe in your heart, saying it out loud. I believe you died for me. So you can just say, God, I believe you died for me. That Jesus came to save my soul. And I'm asking you to forgive me of all my sin. Because I want to follow you all the days of my life. And I believe Jesus rose again from the dead. And he's alive right now. And I need you, Jesus, to help me. To save me. And to keep me. God, I pray for those that would turn to you tonight, that it would be real and genuine, not just emotional, because sometimes pain brings out all these emotions, but, but really for the sake of the work of your spirit, that it's real, genuine, powerful, near and far. Pour out your spirit in abundance, Lord. Give your spiritual gifts. Empower with the baptism of your spirit today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Church. For prayer, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. To listen to this message in its entirety or to join us for our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.